Shalom, shalom. You're listening to Live Internet Studies. This is episode number 221. My name is Arvind Lyman Hanavi. Let's open with a quick word of prayer. Avino Makeno, our Father, our King. Lord, we express our thanks and praise to you for the time that you have allotted to us to once again um, study your words, to press in and um, in- increase not just our knowledge and understanding of your ways, but to ultimately allow the Holy Spirit to use this time to continue to shape our lives and to mold us into the pattern of your Son, Yeshua. Indeed, that is our goal, is to glorify Him and to honor His name and to build up His kingdom and to uh, bring others into a place where they can make a decision for Yeshua, for the positive. Um, we know as we study these topics, uh, both the eschatology topic as well as the uh, the um, apologetics topic that shows up later on, we know that ultimately our the, the goal of studying the Bible is to come to a relationship with God through His Son, Yeshua, Jesus, and so that we can walk in the Spirit and be ambassadors for you and to be lights and to be witnesses for you in this very dark world. So help us to have the proper um, uh, goals and motivations uh, set before us. Uh, thank you for this time that we can spend together. I know it's fun. It's entertaining, yes. Uh, and it's um, it can be a time for us to just fellowship with one another. This is true. But Lord, we, we realize that um, um, there's work to be done. Uh, the harvest is, is ripe and we've been commissioned to go into the world and to, to take this good news and to sow the seeds of, of the gospel and to bring uh, sinners to repentance and continue to strengthen the, the, the brethren, to, to strengthen one another uh, in our love for one another. So uh, thank you for this responsibility. Um, help me to um, bring uh, the message that you want me to bring um, to the people that you've brought to this particular discussion in YouTube and in iTunes. And I'll be careful to give you the praise and glory of Yeshua. Amen. Shalom, shalom. Uh, Thank you once again for joining me during these live internet studies. My name is Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi. This is segment one of two segments. This is an hour long live study. Uh, an hour is given over to eschatology, a biblical study of end time events, and thirty minutes is given over to a trinitarian response to biblical unitarian biblical unitarianism. So I hope you can stick around for both topics. What you can see on your screen right now is the topical uh, index or uh, schedule of this particular segment one, eschatology. And we've already worked our way through topics one through five. We're now on topic six, excursus, antichrist, according to Robert Van Campen. Let's jump right back in where we left off last week. We're talking about these notes. We're borrowing these notes from uh, Van Campen's book, The Sign, which you can get on Amazon. All right, here's where we left off. I backed up one paragraph. I'm not going to elaborate on the paragraph. I'll just read through it, and then we'll keep going. See if we can make a little bit more progress, because I think you guys are getting it based on the um, feedback that I'm getting from YouTube and the emails that I'm I'm interacting with. And uh, so um, I'm delighted that that this is uh, uh, kicking in. Here's what Van Campen has to say. First, a little history. We're looking at, by the way, Antichrist, the future Antichrist, the future leader who's According to the futurist model that I hold to, and that most, uh, that many Christians also hold to, versus the preterist model, um, in the futurist model, there's a future man who's going to hit the scene, who's going to uh, interact with Israel first, and then with the rest of the world as well. It's gonna, his relationship with Israel is going to spill out over into the rest of the world. And so, to the degree that I understand Scripture teaches that we will be around when the Antichrist is introduced into human history... I believe that these words and these studies are relevant for us. But in order to gain a better appreciation for understanding the actions of Antichrist and his um, dealings with Israel, we are taking a look at a forerunner to Antichrist known as Antiochus Epiphanes, or Antiochus IV. Epiphanes was a name that he gave to himself, which means God manifest. And he lived in the first, like the 200 centuries 200 centuries, 200 years prior to the first century. So he lived in a time period before Israel, I'm sorry, before um, Jesus walked the scene. You can read about him in history, in your history books, or you can read about him in a a, a Maccabean uh, trend, a Maccabean book of the Bible, book of Maccabees, etc. So let's, we're reading is, uh, we're looking at the future Antichrist as seen through the activities of 
the forerunner to Antichrist and Tychus Epiphany. So, first, a little history. This is uh, Van Campen uh, speaking of ancient Israel. Long after the end of her own monarchies and after most of the exiles had returned to the Promised Land, so we're talking about the time period leading up to the um, time period of the Maccabees, right, this, uh, 200 years before Christ, God's chosen nation, the natural line of Abraham, they continued and persisted in ever-increasing apostasy, which is, again, no um, no surprise. Israel um, gets herself into hot water and into trouble. They cry out to God for a deliverer. God rescues them, and then no sooner than, than he rescues them and, and delivers them from their oppressors, then they start playing the harlot and, and uh, uh, disobeying God again. So they were persisting in ever-increasing apostasy, apostasy once again. Because of their blatant disbelief and disobedience, the Lord not only allowed his nation to be conquered and persecuted by an increasingly cruel pagan oppressor named Antiochus Epiphanes, which we learned from history that he's the Greek king of Syria, but... God even permitted his own holy temple in Jerusalem to be profaned. And this was really, if you remember, within the context of what God had already told Daniel would happen to his people, even though at the time that Daniel was being written, Daniel's uh, people, Israel, were already in exile in Babylon. God promised, I'm going to bring you out of exile, bring you back into your land, but then there's going to be some events that are going to lead to the temple being destroyed again and your people being kicked out of land again. I mean, Daniel had to probably like, you know, pull his hair out in frustration with what God was actually showing him. All right, let's continue. Uh, Van Campen says, an informative and vivid picture of Antiochus is found in the apocryphal book of First Maccabees, which, although not being inspired scripture, nonetheless provides reliable historical information about that time that we're looking at right now. Uh, Van Campen continues, The writer gives the following account of the invasion of Israel by Antiochus and of Israel's willingness to make peace with him at any cost. So we're reading about now in the book of the Maccabees, the account of Antiochus, who is a forerunner, a shadow, a, 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 um, a prototype of the future um despot known as the Antichrist. And with the perspective that we're using, which is kind of known as um, prophetic telescoping, near, far, now, and not yet, we're seeing that Daniel is given details about this wicked ruler and his dealings with Israel. And many of the details that Daniel's given are are going to be utilized to um, uh, foretell what Ant Antichrist himself is going to do. So we have dual purpose to a prophecy. We have God giving details to Daniel once, and yet they only partially get fulfilled in Antiochus. They get completely or totally fulfilled in Antichrist. So we have the partial fulfillment earlier on in Antiochus, and we have the total fulfillment in Antichrist in the future. That's the way we're um, utilizing this part of, of our study at the moment. Let's look at the book of Maccabees. Um, and there came out of them a wicked root, Antiochus, surname Epiphany, son, son of Antiochus, the king. In those days went there out of Israel wicked men who persuaded many uh, fellow Israelites, saying, and this is the account that we're reading about in the book of Maccabees, saying, let us go and make a covenant with the heathen that are round about us, for... Since we departed from them, we have had much sorrow. The address is 1 Maccabees uh, chapter 1, verses 10 through 11. So notice right away that the account in the book of Maccabees describes the relationship that ancient Israel is entering into with this wicked ruler, this Antiochus uh, figure. And they're saying, let's make a covenant with, these are Jews, by the way, um, Jewish people in, in uh, the future entries before Christ, they're saying, let's make this covenant with this with this Gentile ruler, this, this Syrian ruler, this Greek Syrian ruler, because if we do so, he's at least going to spare us the persecution um, from his own armies. And um, as long as we kind of go along with his program, then the, 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 the non-Jews around us aren't going to persecute us. And so it's kind of like 
the Jewish people are capitulating and they're giving in. They're 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 backpedaling on the covenant that they made with God to be different from the surrounding nations. Instead, they're they're compromising on their relationship with God by saying, "Let's just give in and relax a little bit. Do we have to be different from the world? Do we have to be separated and um, holy unto God." I mean, it always brings trouble, <clears throat> always brings persecution. Let's just kind of give in to the surrounding uh, circumstances and go with the flow for a little bit, and things will be a little easier for us. And so that becomes the kind of the um, picture of what's going to happen when Antichrist comes onto the scene as well in the 70th week of Daniel. Earlier on, in as we enter into the final seven-year uh, period of the transition from this age into the age to come, and to, and to the transition of the kingdom of God here on earth. These last seven years that we're describing with the 70th week of Daniel picture is that Antichrist is going to um, enter into some type of agreement with Israel again, and he's going to broker some type of uh, treaty between Israel and her surrounding neighbors, whether it be the Arabs or that surround her or the Muslim groups around her or even the Gentile world around her. He's going to make make it possible that peace in the Middle East will finally be um, actualized at a level that has never, ever been um, witnessed by uh, the world at large. And so this will kind of clue us, those of us who are uh, Bible students and are watching world events, but we're reading our Bible first and foremost. This should help us understand, hey, we've seen this before. So let's pick this theme up <clears throat> with um, Ben Campen's notes here. That covenant with Antiochus closely parallels the covenant that Daniel predicted Antichrist will make with Israel at the beginning of the 70th week. That's exactly what I just said. If I would have just kept re reading, I wouldn't have had to stop and explain everything. Um, notice this quote from Daniel 9. And he, speaking of Antichrist, will make a firm covenant with the many, that is Israel, for one week. That's Daniel 9.27. That is, uh, um, uh, Van Camp reminds us, that is, for the final seven-year period, during the last half of which Antichrist will wreak the greatest persecution of all time upon the earth. So, that's why we're studying through Antiochus right now. We're not really so much going through a history lesson. I hope you guys are catching this, right? <clears throat> this is not about um, becoming better historians. This is so that we can use what Yeshua himself kind of hinted at when he told his when he told his disciples and now us by inclusion because we were reading the words that he left behind. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, right? This was given to us in Matthew 24. What the master was informing us is that past history is going to help you understand the future events that are about to come. Of course, a lot of what Yeshua told them, and his disciples in Matthew there in the Olivet Discourse, which we'll get to in time, a lot of what he told them took place shortly thereafter during the siege of the temple in 70 AD, the destruction of the temple, and the siege of Jerusalem in the following in the 130s. So they, they the people of Israel who were um, uh, preparing themselves using the words of the Master, were using not just past events, to uh, like Antiochus, to also prepare them for what was taking place then, but also we realize that now, 2,000 years later, as we begin to realize that Israel is now settled back in her land again, she got kicked out, but now she made her way back by God's grace, and now that she's back in the land, that events are shaping up that are going to um, be actualized in the uh, 70th, 70th week of Daniel as it unfolds before our very eyes in, in these days that we're living in, which I believe are fast approaching. I could be wrong. could be another 50 or 100 years down the road, but it doesn't seem like that. The the, the, the state of affairs in the world today, uh, the temperature, if you might want to call it, of, 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 um, of current affairs just seems to be rapidly going in the direction of um, uh, we're probably going to see um, prophetic events begin to unfold probably within a generation, really. I uh, could be wrong, but um, we need to be prepared either way. Let's keep reading Van Campen. He, he uh, states, Many Jews, other than the faithful remnant, the woman, were so eager to please Antiochus and to avoid persecution that they not only forsook the Mosaic law, but even their racial identity and heritage, considering themselves from then on to be Gentiles. 
So there's this phenomenon known as epispasm where the um, males sought to reverse the physical marks of physical circumcision, right? Without getting too graphic, you guys have to kind of understand what I'm saying there. Those of you who are adults and listening to this uh, uh, podcast and watching this YouTube video. So, um, but either way, what, what ancient Israel was doing was they were flirting with the enemy in an effort to secure some form of peace and safety, at least from their perspective. We're going to find out from other passages, like such as the book of Isaiah, that God was watching all of this right back in Antiochus Day, and he's going to watch what Israel is going to do in the future with uh, Antichrist. And God describes it as a covenant of death. And the reason it's called that is on a number of levels, but some of the reasons are that Israel is making an agreement not with God, her protector, for life, a covenant where God promised to protect her if they would be obedient to him and trust him and um, follow in his ways. Instead, Israel is deciding to take matters into their own hands, entering into uh, agreements with the surrounding uh, leaders uh, with her, which, you know, on the on the surface level is not wrong in the sense of, you know, you want to have peace with your neighbor, so you got to have some kind of talk. But the point is God is seeing through to the heart and the motives of Israel, why are you doing what you're doing? You don't trust me. God has it in his um, program to protect Israel and to bring her into a place of peace and safety, ultimately. But God realizes that Israel is dealing and working with um, uh, an, an uncircumcised heart, a heart of disbelief. And so God's allowing Israel to take these actions, ultimately, so that he can bring her to the crucible. He can put her into the pressure cooker and bring her to a place where she is broken and on her knees and crying out uh, for forgiveness to the God that she has um, fors forsaken. Let's keep reading Van Campen. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Let's try that again. Um, so we have a quote here um, from the book of Maccabees. Once again, this is Van Campen. The plan seemed good in their eyes, and some of the people went eagerly to the king, and he authorized them to introduce practices of the heathen. Now, let me interject. What's the big deal about Israel just adopting some of the practices of the heathen? Well, you and I both know that God forbadely, for, uh, expressly forbade Israel from mimicking the practices of the surrounding nations. Right? God singled out Israel as a special covenant people, um, like what I was talking about with my um, uh, members in the live study with me now before the study started. God singled out Israel to be the recipient of specialized revelation, not just generalized revelation that God gave to the entire world about you know, prohibitions against murder and incest and, and adultery and um, prohibitions against... Um, uh, uh, you know, um, um, just overtaking people groups and doing whatever you want. Um, Israel was singled out with specialized revelation that included details that only Israel was privy to because she was the one that was given the Torah at Mount Sinai. God didn't bring all of the Egyptians to Mount Sinai and give them the Torah. He separated his people from the Egyptians in the Exodus story, brought Israel to the foot of Sinai, Israel at this point in time, which was composed of native-born sons of Jacob, as well as um, those who had left Egypt from the surrounding nations. So Israel was already at that point in time a bouquet of, of um, surrounding people groups, but uh, uh, covenantally they were still Israel. He brought them to the foot of Sinai to give them specialized instructions for showcasing and highlighting the plans that God was going to give to the rest of the world. But Israel became the servants. Israel became the butlers uh, of God's family to serve the rest of the world. And so, in this plan that we're reading about in the book of Maccabees, where Israel decided to adopt some of the practices of the surrounding nations, stop circumcising their sons, stop keeping the Sabbath, and start enjoying some of the other festivals that the surrounding nations are doing, this was displeasing to God on multiple levels, but it, it marred the image that God had for Israel. God had uh, set them apart as a covenant people, separate and distinct from the people groups, to be a light to the surrounding nations. And if they were just going to do what the surrounding nations were doing, then they weren't going to be a witness. And so we're going to see that um, this is 
supposed to um, inform us of what the Antichrist is going to get Israel to do in the future. Somehow he's going to get them to, on the one hand, enter an agreement with the surrounding uh, nations so they can have some, some semblance of peace. At the same time, we see that a, a lot of Israel is going to apostatize and begin to forsake the covenant again, just like they did before. Um, Israel will become more secular in that in that sense. So that we'll have the ultra religious in Israel that are going to you know start doing the sacrifices, and you know they'll be that minority. But the majority of Israel seems to probably be going in the direction of. You know, do we really need the law of Moses? You know, it's such an antiquated document. If we can just um, adopt some of the practices of the surrounding nations, the surrounding Muslim groups and Arab groups, you know, maybe we can start keeping parts of Quran. Who knows? You know, um, we can have some peace with our neighbors and they'll let us up on the Temple Mount and do whatever. Who knows? Th those are things that were, in those are discussions that we're entertaining at the moment. Let's keep reading Van Campen. This is still within the Maccabean quote. And they built, speaking of the Jewish people of that day, they built a gymnasium in Jerusalem. By the way, this isn't a gymnasium like you would find in a in a park, right? It's not that type of jungle gym that your kids uh, climb on. It's, that's not the gymnasium that we're talking about. This was a um, a, 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 a edifice, a, a building that was built for the express purpose of um, holding a kind of sports events that would maybe resemble almost like um, mer uh, um, what we might think of as like Olympic type events. But within that gymnasium, as I understand history, um, the uh, members of the gymnasium, the people that, that participate in those sporting events and, and activities inside the gymnasium, according to the uh, history books, it was performed in the nude. And so that was something that was, that was against God's um, moral standards to, right there. So they built a gymnasium in the heathen fashion and submitted to uncircumcision right epispasm and disowned the holy agreement. They, speaking of Israel, allied themselves with the heathen and became the slaves of wrongdoing. That's 1 Maccabees 1, uh, 12 through 15. So again, we're seeing that Israel was putting themselves in a position where they said, if we can just get along with the with the with the gentile nations that the 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 the, um, the greek syrian ruler and the the, the greco uh, roman uh, authorities around us if we just give in and do what they are asking us to do instead of being so different and particular and set apart and weird then um maybe we'll have some peace maybe we can get along maybe they'll stop persecuting us maybe they'll um stop taxing us so heavily maybe they'll um give us a, a certain amount of um of uh, freedom to move around a little bit more. Maybe we'll, they'll, um, you know, um, help support some of our programs and things like that. So they, they thought what they were doing was innocent. Those Israelites in that day, they thought what they were doing was, was not such a bad thing, right? You know, can't we just all get along? Can't we just live and let live, right? Et cetera, et cetera. Let's keep reading um, Van Campen. That great apostasy of ancient Israel, again, parallels the apostasy that many of their far distant descendants will fall into after making the ungodly covenant with Antichrist at the beginning of the 70th week. So that's why we're studying this part of um, Van Campen. We're realizing that there are parallels between what ancient Israel and Antiochus did 200 centuries, I keep saying 200 centuries, I apologize, 200 years, two centuries, prior to the time of Yeshua, right, 200 BC, what took place then, and what we see is going to take place again in the near future. And the parallels are connected by the prophecies of Daniel. That's what we're making the um, connection. Van Campen continues, during the first half of the week, i.e. during the first three and a half years of the 70th week, the true identity as Antichrist will not be known. And, like in the days of Antiochus, many of the natural line of Abraham will fall easy prey to the covenant maker and his promises of peace and safety for Israel. So that's the warning that we're living with. That's the danger that we're facing in the future is if Israel doesn't learn her history from the past, if she doesn't learn her lesson, her lesson from past history, then the old axiom, axiom is that if you don't learn from history, then you're doomed to repeat it. And of course, unfortunately, since scripture's already written, it appears that, that much of Israel is going to simply fall in line with what they've already done before and make some of the same mistakes. Let's keep reading through Van Campen. 
Initially, after the covenant is signed at the beginning of the 70th week or something like that, Israel will enjoy the worldly security, right? You read Ezekiel 38, 8, and 14. They, speaking of Israel, um, they obtain through their alignment, the security they obtain with their alignment through the Antichrist, their alignment with the Antichrist, read Daniel 9, 27. Yet the prophet Isaiah, that's what I mentioned earlier, he calls our covenant a covenant with death, right? Read uh, Isaiah 28, 15, as well as 18. So they're not going to call it a covenant of death, right? Israel's not going to say, we're not, we're not making a covenant of death. But God realizes that it's a covenant with death. He realizes that he knows the future. He knows that just like Antichrist or Antiochus, he knows that Antichrist isn't really looking out for the best interest of Israel. He doesn't care about their peace and safety. He's just manipulating them, right? He's gaslighting them. He's going to be um, utilizing them like pawns on a chessboard, moving them into a, a place where he can then um, take over the uh, the Temple Mount and set up his headquarters and begin to um, execute this worldwide persecution, world new world order, this one world religion uh, under himself as the god of this of this new religion. Um, he's going to enforce, as we know from the book of Revelation, he's going to enforce these um, universal policies of um, buying and selling through the mark and this beast, um, this this uh, image that's set up uh, and this mark that's that's applied to the hand of the forehead, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all of this is going to spell disaster, not just for Israel, but eventually for the entire world. But it begins with Israel right there in the Middle East. They're the epicenter. Uh, Van Campen continues, this will be a false security. Read Ezekiel 38, uh, verse 10 and 11. However, perfectly paralleling the early days of ancient Israel's conquest by Antiochus, when because of their compromise with that pagan ruler, the Israelites lived, quote, in a time of tranquility, right? Read Daniel eleven twenty-one. 21. So again, as long as Antichrist has Israel fooled at the beginning of this um, time, everything seems to be okay with Israel and with the surrounding nations. Everybody's happy. Antichrist is happy. Israelites are happy. The surrounding nations are happy. Um, things to be, seem to be going fine. But just like we read about in the history books with Antiochus Epiphanes, the same thing's going to happen in the parallel uh, with the Antichrist. Um, at the midpoint of the week, Antichrist is going to reveal who he truly is. This is, of course, because God says this is what's going to happen, right? Remember, God's still in control of end-time events. And once the midpoint takes place, that's when um, things are really going to heat up. Let's keep moving uh, quickly through... Um, of Van Camp, and I think we're making uh, excellent time here. I'm trying to make up for some of the time that's lost whenever there's a missed uh, study like we had um, two weeks ago because of the uh, Shavuot break. Then when I come out of those uh, missed breaks, I have to do a lot of um, review. Um, and so uh, it seems like the study kind of lags. But now that we're, um, we don't have any breaks in, on the schedule that I can see, we can start going at the kind of full steam. All right. This is uh, uh, Van Campen. We learn also from the historical record of Maccabees what God had predicted through Daniel centuries earlier. Remember, prophetic telescoping allows for one set of prophecies to be given to any particular prophet like Daniel, and yet it has dual usage. It's used partially in the near term towards Daniel in historical events that take place closer to Daniel's timeline. That's what we mean by the term near or now. And yet the same prophecy is reused or um, um, uh, completed, finished in the far term or total fulfillment of an event that's farther away from the prophet, such as Daniel. So it's, it's, it's dual usage in that sense. It's almost like it's um, recycled. Uh, but from God's perspective, if we carefully look at the prophecy, we'll notice that there are details that history now confirms that weren't exhausted in that first historical event. So when we read through Daniel, we can realize, ah, part of this was talking about Antiochus, and yet part of it hasn't been fulfilled yet. There's still details that are waiting to happen that must be future. Of course, when Daniel wrote those details down, he may not have known what we know now because history hadn't passed by him yet. He may have, for all intents and purposes, assumed that everything was going to take place during the time periods of Antiochus. We don't know. 
we, we, we'll have to ask Daniel when we see him. Let's keep reading um, Ben Campen. Speaking of Antich- uh, Antiochus, after his conquest of Israel was complete and presumed secure, Antiochus then turned his eyes to Egypt. Let's look at this quote from Maccabees. Now, when the kingdom over Israel was established before Antiochus, he thought to reign over Egypt, that he might have the dominion of two realms. This, of course, um, this quote here is from 1 Maccabees 1.16. Uh, Anti- uh, Van Campen continues, Again, the actions of Antiochus parallel the actions of Antichrist in the last days. Again, predicted by Daniel. Let's read from Daniel now. He, Antichrist, will also enter the beautiful land that is Israel. Continuing, Then he will stretch out his hand against other countries, and the land of Egypt will not escape. That's a quote from Daniel chapter 11, around verse 42, 41, 42, etc. So again, we see some parallels. Antiochus is taking actions against Israel and against the peoples that are very, very near to Israel, Egypt, and uh, we, all, we already know that uh, much of the Italy, Middle East uh, is so um, closely, is so densely packed, you know, it's not, not largely spread out, so densely packed, there's people here and there, um, what am I trying to say? It's it's such a smaller area, not like you know huge like the United States or something like that, but such a small area that anything that takes place in one small country kind of spills out over into some of the other smaller countries. Let's keep reading uh, Van Campen. In the meantime, Israel considered herself safe under the despotic but thus far lenient rule of Antiochus. Again, from the historical book of First Maccabees. We see that after conquering Egypt, Antiochus moved his troops back northward into Israel. Right, so he's uh, he's he's um, he's 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 got his eyes set on Egypt, but not just Egypt. He's still set and bent on um, on getting these Jewish people to do uh, what he wants to do, and he begins a treacherous, like Van Campus says, a treacherous and merciless campaign of murder, pillaging, destruction, and sacrilege. And that's, a, a, that's Van Campen's uh, uh, insert, his notes. But let's read another quote from the first Maccabees. Quote, And after Antiochus had ravaged Egypt in the 143rd year, he returned and went up against Israel. And he made a great slaughter of Israelite men and spoke very proudly and there was great mourning in Israel and in every place where they were. And that's a quote from 1 Maccabees 1, 20 and, uh, 24 and 25. All right. So this is a quote from uh, Maccabees, and it's describing the movements of Antiochus, but yet we realize because of the parallel application to what's going to take place in the future with Antichrist and Israel again, very likely. Now this is just Maccabees, but when we go back and look at Daniel, which is um, uh, what we consider um, uh, uh, this is now scripture. This is this is anointed scripture, right? The Book of Maccabees is not. It's the, the distinction I'm trying to make. But when we look at Daniel, we can begin to realize that um, because of scripture's uh, reliability then we can now begin to um, expect that Antichrist is going to have similar movements uh, as he interacts with both Israel and with Egypt uh, and things like that. This is Van Campen once again. The foregoing passage from 1 Maccabees that we just read is actually recorded history. In the book of Daniel, however, we see the prediction of that historical event centuries before it ever came to pass. So what we're doing is we're interacting with both Maccabees, which is history, as well as the book of Daniel, which is um, anointed scripture, right? Which is uh, uh, also past history. In fact, let me interject and say that many historians who are aware of what took place historically in this time period that we're discussing have gone back and read through parts of Daniel. And because of the um, accuracy to which to which Daniel was written, many historians who aren't um, 
who aren't very uh, trusting of the Bible itself look at the book of Daniel and accuse it of basically plagiarizing history, saying, well, it must have been written after the fact because it's so accurate. How could something like this be so accurate? All right. We, of course, as uh, Bible-believing Christians who trust in the authority of the Scriptures and realize its accuracy is given by the Spirit of God, we know that's how Daniel could know these things in advance because God's Spirit revealed it to him. But skeptics, of course, don't have that perspective. Let's read Daniel. Then he, Antiochus it is, will return to his land from Egypt in the south with much plunder, but his heart will be set against the holy covenant between God and Israel. Remember the brackets that you're seeing here on your screen in Daniel? Those are supplied by Van Camp, and those aren't going to show up in your Bible. Unless you're reading a paraphrased version of the Bible, you might have some of those inserts in there. But, um, so speaking of the, of the Antichrist, um, and he will take action and then return to his own land, speaking of Antiochus. At the appointed time, he will return and come into the south, but this last time, it will not turn out the way it did before. Remember, we're reading these words from Daniel, and they are very similar to what we read about in the book of Maccabees, which is more historical. But we have to remember that this prophecy that was given to Daniel, even before it took place in Antiochus' day, is nevertheless uh, reliable enough to be speaking of what's going to take place in the future with Antichrist. Now again, I'm not telling you that every single word that Daniel wrote down that Antichrist um, uh, followed, I'm not saying every single one of those steps are going to be repeated by Antichrist. I can't know that for certainty. What I'm saying is that the overall picture that Scripture is giving to us seems to be the same, that it's one prophecy, and yet it's speaking to two different individuals, and so we could have Antichrist of the future mimicking step by step everything that Antiochus did. That's true. It's possible. There's no, no reason why it couldn't be that way. At the same time, there could be only parts of what Antiochus did earlier, 2,000 years ago, Antichrist will um, repeat. So it could work out either way. But either uh, the, the point is that we need to be looking at this prophecy and be uh, allow ourselves a little bit of um, leeway because we don't know which parts are going to be repeated verbatim. But, I mean, it could be. Um, Daniel continues, for ships of, of Katim, that is Italy, this is, again, these are Van Campen's um, inserts with the little brackets where he put Italy. That's not going to show up in your Bible. He believes that Katim is Italy here. We could do a study on who these ancient names point to, and there's going to be some obviously some disagreement here and there. But generally speaking, we're still talking about that part of the world where the Mediterranean finds its focus, right? Israel, um, what we would look at today as modern-day Turkey, um, modern-day uh, Egypt and Upper Africa, uh, the um, the uh, uh, the area around um, Greece today, uh, the area around Europe today, um, and then when we look further east towards the Middle East and keep going north, we're talking about areas that deal with um, Iran, Iraq, uh, Syria, um, ultimately Iran. Um, Jordan, if we get closer to Israel, right? Jordan and the West Bank. And um, so we're, we're, we're looking at um, this part of the world. So, um, you know, if, for instance, if Van Campen would have inserted, it said, for ships of Katim, and then in brackets, he would have, if, if he would have put, like, say, um, America or uh, uh, South America or uh, Hawaii or or japan or something then i i would really question his interpretation of that ancient name katim but he puts italy there so and that's still in that geographical part of the world where most of these events are going to be taking place so i'm gonna be a little bit more leading all right so um ships of katim will come against him speaking of the antichrist and of antiochus therefore he will be disheartened and will return and become enraged at the holy covenant that is between god and israel and he'll take action. We're reading these words from Daniel, but we know that they apply to Antiochus and they apply to Antichrist. So, Daniel continues, he will come back to Israel and show regard in his favor for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. Remember, that's similar to what we already read about 
in, in, in the book of Maccabees about how the people already agreed, the people of Israel already agreed to forsake the covenant that they had with God so that they could um, gain the favor of the surrounding peoples and the, the leaders of the surrounding nations that were oppressing them that were, weren't giving them the protection that they'd wanted. They, 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 had, they decided within themselves that God's protection wasn't truly enough and that they instead wanted to make a covenant with the Gentile nations. This, again, is where God steps in and tells us through the prophets that this is Israel's problem, their lack of trust in God. This is really what it boils down to. And so God allows Israel to enter into these actions and take these make these decisions and make these wrong decisions so that she can be purged and purified through the hardship, through the trials and the tribulation. She has to go into the trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble. She has to go into that time period, into the tribulational period, so that she can be refined and come out the other end purified, right? She has to get, the heat has to turn up. And so God, God's using her actions for his purposes. Let's continue. Daniel quotes, and forces from him, speaking of the Antichrist, will arise, speaking of Antiochus slash Antichrist, will arise, desecrate the sanctuary fortress, and do away with the regular sacrifice. Have we heard those events before? I hope you've been paying attention. We have. The events that are going to be taking place around the middle of the 70th week of Daniel are a repeat of what already took place in Antiochus' day, where he decided to attack the temple of God, desecrate the sanctuary, do away with the regular sacrifice. And then what does Daniel record next, right? These are words that we're familiar with. And they will set up the abomination of desolation. There's our quote that the master um, reminds us of in his Matthew discourse, where he's talking to his disciples. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, right? That's the warning. That's the alarm when you see this happen. And yet when Yeshua spoke those words in Matthew chapter 24, these events in Daniel had already taken place in Antiochus' day, right? This was 200-year-old history to the disciples that were listening to Yeshua's words. And yet Yeshua is saying, when you see this happen, what is Yeshua saying? He's saying it's, it's going to repeat. You're going to see it happen again. Well, shortly thereafter, like I said, in 70 AD, the temple got destroyed again by the Roman armies, by Titus and his armies. And then in when the 130s, uh, Jerusalem itself got um, plowed under by the Gentile peoples and Israel got scattered to the four winds. And yet... If you look at history, all of the events of setting up the abomination of desolation, doing away with the regular sacrifice, um, all of the details that Daniel describes were not exhausted in the first century events. They were neither exhausted in Antiochus' day, nor were they exhausted when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD and in the 130s. There are still details that we read about, not just in Daniel, but we read about in the um, letters that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, as well as some other uh, letters that show up in the New Testament, like in Peter, first and second Peter, first and second third John, record some more details about anti uh, about Antichrist, and then finally we get to the bombshell, which is the Book of Revelation, and there are details that are given by John the Revelator, which took place after the destruction of the temple by most accounts, right in the 90s. But there are details that are spelled out that, according to the futurist interpretation of prophecy, are pointing towards future um, events. So we can we can begin to realize that if the futurist model is accurate, which I believe it is, then Antichrist is going to have to fulfill these final events. Let's keep reading Daniel here. And by smooth words, he, this, this wicked ruler, will turn to godlessness those who act wickedly, towards the covenant, but the people who know their God will display strength and take action. So these are details of prophecy that we can begin to expect. They took place in the first century, or the, the, the um, 200 years before Yeshua, they took place during that time. And a lot of these details, of, if we read and corroborate with the other prophecies, are going to take place again when Antichrist um, hits the scene here in the near future.
Let's keep looking at Daniel. And those who have insight among the people, that is the spiritual descendants of Abraham, they will give understanding to the many, the natural line of Abraham. Right? These are events that are taking place, but not all is lost. God is allowing those who are studying scriptures, those who are following prophecy, those who have a, a mind and a heart towards wanting to go, do God's ways, even in the face of persecution and tribulation that's, that's, that's um, happening all around them, God is going to allow some of those people to have insight and to have an understanding of what's taking place. Daniel says, Yet they will fall by sword and by flame, by captivity, and by plunder for many days. Right? That's Daniel 11, 28-33. So, as we're drawing this part of our study to a close, um, what we're seeing as we're looking at um, and, uh, Van Campen's uh, description about Antiochus with a view towards Antichrist, what we're seeing is that as we go into the 70th week, if we're indeed still here around, we, we the church, we believers, if we haven't been raptured away by the pre-trip rapture that many people talk about, if indeed we're still around, which according to my understanding of end-time events, we will still be here. If that's the case, then not only will these events um, impact Israel in the Middle East, but eventually they'll spill out into the rest of the world with the worldwide persecution of anyone who opposes Antichrist's new world order that he's going to be imposing. Obviously, Jerusalem will be under siege. Uh, Antichrist will um, um, uh, take over uh, the Temple Mount there in Jerusalem. He will um, set up his headquarters there, and he'll begin uh, persecuting not just Israel and anyone who opposes him there in the Middle East, but eventually, as I mentioned, this will impact everyone in the world. But to the degree that there's going to be tribulation facing Israel in those last days, God has promised through these prophets, and this is, what, this is my emphasis, God has promised through the prophet Daniel, not just Daniel, but Daniel for now, God has promised that this persecution is going to impact the people of God. God is going to allow the wickedness of this Antichrist figure, this Antiochus figure, this wicked ruler, he's going to allow him a certain amount of victory over God's people. For a time, there's going to be persecution of God's people, and there will be martyrdom, great martyrdom, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of dead bodies in those days. And you, you would think, well, why wouldn't God supernaturally protect us? What's, what happened to the Goshen principle where, where God's protecting all of his people, like read out the book of Exodus? Well, there is some of that that's going to be going on during the tribulation, yes, I imagine, but a good number of, um, of otherwise righteous people are going to lose their lives. That's just um, part of God's program of what's going to be taking place during that time. So we're not going to get into those details just now. Let's keep reading through Van Camp. We're making great time. Let's read through maybe um, one or two more paragraphs, and we'll draw this part of our study to a close. That sacrilege was the culmination of Antiochus' initial plan to completely eradicate Jewish religion. He had already forbade Jewish worship on the Sabbath, the rite of circumcision, the observance of religious festivals, and the offering of the Mosaic Temple sacrifices. These are um, details that history has already um, confirmed for us. We can read about these things that took place. Let's keep reading Van Campen. He ordered the destruction of all copies of the Hebrew scriptures that could be found. What, he, what else did he do? He commanded all Jews to eat pork and had numerous altars erected throughout Israel at which Jews under pain of death Right? These are the actions of um, Antiochus uh, that took place historically, and we can assume that, with a safe assumption, because Scripture gives us precedent for us, we can assume that many of these actions will be uh, mimicked by the, the uh, coming uh, wicked Antichrist. So, um, Jews under pains of death were ordered to offer sacrifices of swine on these altars that were scattered throughout Israel. Um, Van Campen reminds us, had it not been for the successful Jewish revolt under Judas Maccabeus, Antiochus doubtless would have destroyed this second temple, that is Zerubbabel's uh, temple that we're um, reading about, just as Nebuchadnezzar had done with the Temple of Solomon several centuries earlier. Read through 2 Kings 25 
8 and 9. So are you guys beginning to see why it's important for us to study um, the historical account of Antiochus Epiphanes as he ravaged through Israel and ravaged through the temple and uh, committed all these heinous acts against Israel and against God's covenant, etc., etc.? It's not just so that we can just be better historians. Again, if we believe that Daniel's prophecies have some application for the future and we believe that there's near for our application, then to the certainty and degree that uh, Scripture is reliable and trustable, then we believe that these actions will repeat themselves under this future Antichrist who's going to hit the scene uh, very, very shortly. Let's read um, another paragraph from uh, Van Campen. That most blasphemous of all desecrations of the Jerusalem temple occurred in 168 BC when Antiochus ordered that swine, the most ceremonially unclean of all animals, be offered on the temple altar of burnt offerings. Right? This is the abomination of desolation that's spoken of. Uh, Van Campen continues, and to make the sacrilege still worse, he insisted that those animals be offered to, not to God, but to the pagan god Zeus. Why? Because he had declared himself to be Theos Epiphanes, meaning the manifest God. That's why his name is Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus IV declared himself to be God manifest at that time. He had this idea in his mind that he was very God among the people. Does that sound familiar? Yes, it does. Yes, it should. Why? Because not just Daniel now, but Paul picks up on this theme. And in Paul's day, he realized that this future Antichrist figure was going to repeat some of the same things that, Antichrist, that Antiochus already did. And so Paul describes him in the Thessalonian passages as taking himself, uh, uh, setting himself in the temple taking a seat in the temple of God, setting himself up to be God and the object of worship. He, he, he opposes all uh, that are recognized as gods or so-called gods, etc. Et I'm, I'm paraphrasing what Paul said, but you guys are probably familiar with the, with the uh, passage anyway. And so that gives us uh, a lot of um, detail that we can look forward to, not in a good way, but we can look forward to as these events unfold uh, before our very eyes in these last days. Let's keep reading uh, Antiochus and draw our study to a close here. So um, he uh, set himself up in the temple back then, right? Two centuries. There I go again. 200 years before um, uh, Yeshua hit the scene. And Antiochus, or, and uh, 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 Van Campus says, and even more explicitly, Zeus Epiphanes, right? The manifestation of Zeus. This is what um, Ant Antiochus thought himself to be, the, the uh, embodiment of Zeus. He was actually demanding worship of himself in place of Almighty God. And that's important as it um, parallels what uh, Antichrist is uh, going to do in the future per what Paul said in his own letter there. I think this is a good place to stop. Let's stop right here uh, where Van Camp is going to uh, continue his thoughts. This would be a good place to, to wind down. So what have we learned in this week's study? We've learned what we've been kind of laying the groundwork for, and that's primarily that in the coming days of, of uh, anti Antichrist, who's going to be um, a, a future leader who's going to seek to establish his, his authority, not just in the Middle East, but he's going to seek to establish his authority throughout the entire world. He's just going to start in the Middle East. What we're learning is that there are very important parallels that can be drawn between Antiochus Epiphanes, who lived 200 years before Jesus, as we read about in the books of the Maccabees, and this coming Antichrist figure who's still yet future, according to the future model of end-time prophecy. So what we learned in tonight's study is that as we read through the books of Daniel and later books like uh, the Thessalonian letters that Paul wrote, and later on even the book of Revelation— we can glean details about what the future Antichrist is going to be doing in his programs and dealings with Israel in the Middle East by looking at what past forerunners and, and shadows and prototypes of the Antichrist, namely Antiochus, what he did. Now, again, there are other Antichrist figures that show up in history, right? There's the Hitlers and the, the people who have persecuted the people of God. 
and yet there's a unique and special kind of place that's uh, given to Antiochus Epiphanes because of the way he plays prominently in the book of Daniel and the prophecies there and the way Yeshua instructed his disciples to pay attention to those details in the book of Daniel with regards to not just the events that befell them in the 70s of their day, 70 AD and the 130s, but also with the events that took place um, that are going to take place in our day. Because remember, when Yeshua spoke to his disciples there in Matthew, the, the words weren't just isolated to their ears. They're recorded by the Holy Spirit and preserved for us today so that we now have those words and we can utilize them so that we also can be better prepared for this Antichrist man who's going to hit the scene and begin to do all these monstrous things in the Middle East. So that's going to uh, be our look at um, eschatology, a biblical study of end time events. We'll pick this up next week. We might even um, finish next week. Uh, no promises, but we're we're making good progress through these uh, through this paragraph, uh, this part of the chapter in um, Van Campen's book, The Sign. So um, uh, stay safe this week, and I hope you can uh, pick up our study again next week. That'll do it for eschatology, a biblical study of end time events. These are the live internet studies brought to you week after week by myself. Ariel Ben Lyman Hanavi, I'm a tour teacher here at Congregation K. Latunavada Harvest in uh, Thornton, Colorado. Find us online at graftedin.com and join us in, in person for our live Sabbath services. But if you're not able to join us, at least as I mentioned, join us online and um, you can see the link to the video right there on my screen as well. These uh, live internet studies are a part of my own um, Torah teaching ministry, which parks itself on the web at tetzetorah.com. That's T-E-T-Z-E-T-O-R-A-H.com. I'd love to have you join me at my own home uh, personal website there and uh, browse around and take a look through all the uh, commentaries that you see on my screen right now as well. I also have a YouTube channel that I'd be delighted if you uh, popped in and uh, took a look around there as well youtube.com forward slash c forward slash tetse torah ministries if you do hit my website uh my youtube channel there be sure to uh, take notice that i update the uh site essentially daily uploading videos daily make sure then to subscribe hit the bell for notifications leave thumbs up for all the videos that you like um, leave me some comments and questions about things you have um, uh, your own thoughts on and be sure to share the content with your other friends and family members in your social media circles okay just some brief important uh, details. If you'd like to join us for our live studies, be sure to get access to Skype somehow. If you're on my website right now um, uh, during the live study and you click on that blue Skype link, it'll actually open up Skype in your browser and you can just join us right there. And we hope you can join us live because we engage in uh, live Q&A after the study is over, opening up the microphones and it's exclusively to the um, uh, live studies. Um, uh, that we uh, enjoy engage in that live study uh, Q and A, but if not, um, take one last moment to scroll to the very bottom of my website where you can see some Hebrew writing and the black section down there, and uh, prayerfully consider partnering with me to take the Torah around the world uh, in this particular format. You can click on the little yellow donate button and um, bless me that way with your uh, financial gifts and contributions, and I'm so uh, blessed to be able to be in a place where I can receive uh, your generous gifts. Uh, thank you to all of those who have given in the past and are continuing to give. I'm so uh, thrilled to be on the receiving end of, of your generosity. And as I always say, be blessed as you seek to be a blessing to others. Let's turn to a Trinitarian response to biblical Unitarianism. My name is Arul bin Lyman Hanavi, and this 30-minute segment is given over to the apologetics of taking the understanding of God's nature through the lens of the biblical Unitarian model and examining it in light of Scripture and what is known as the Orthodox Trinitarian position. I myself am, an, am a Trinitarian believer. I believe that God is Trinity, but I believe in one God. He's three persons. He's one what and three who's. Biblical Unitarianism is a denomination of Christianity that disagrees with the Trinitarian outlook of God. They, they disagree with that model of God. And so we've been looking at their website. You can see on my screen right now, biblicalunitarian.com, a website about God and His Son, Jesus Christ. They are a non-Trinitarian 
Christian denomination. And we've been looking at Psalm 110, verse 1, which let me just read for you right here. This is out of the NASB. A Psalm of David, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. According to biblicalunitarian.com, the second Lord in the, in the uh, verse here that you see that's highlighted on my screen right now is the human king that God has um, established to rule in God's uh, kingdom, and namely Messiah Jesus. But the um, important fact that is highlighted by the biblical Unitarian model is that Jesus is human. He's not divine. He's not eternally one with God like we Trinitarians believe. So we're reading through the biblical Unitarian um, perspective on um, this uh on this uh, uh, verse itself, Psalm 110.1. And we haven't made it through the, uh, their explanation, so let's see if we can finish theirs tonight. I can't really uh, offer any refutation or objection to their position until I've given their position a fair reading. So let me see if I can read without stopping, without stopping too much. I backed up a paragraph like I always do so we can get a kind of a segue between last week's study and this week's study. So we left off... Um, near this paragraph last week. This is biblicalunitarian.com. In the above definition, Adoni and Adonai have the same root, which is Adon, which is the word listed in the concordances and most lexicons. However, the exact words used are different. Adoni, the word used in Psalm 110.1, is never used of God. It is always used of a human or angelic superior. The fact that the Hebrew text uses the word Adoni in the Messiah of the Messiah in Psalm 110 is a very strong is very strong proof that he is not God. If the Messiah was to be God, this is biblical Unitarian, then the word Adonai would have been used. This distinction between Adoni a Lord, lowercase L O R D, and Adonai the Lord, capital L O R D holds even when God shows up in human form in the Old Testament. For instance, they mentioned that. Um, here's an example. In Genesis 18.3, Abraham addresses God who was disguised as a human, but the text uses Adonai. So, that's where we left off last week. Are you understanding and following along what they're saying? They believe that these two Hebrew words that are used in Psalm 110, Adoni and Adonai, and if I go over to uh, the verse here in, in English. The first word here, the Lord says to my Lord, the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D is actually the tetragrammaton name of God, the YHVH, otherwise pronounced Yahweh or Yehovah or Jehovah or um, some people say Yahuwah, things like that. So uh, I myself favor uh, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. So, um, this capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that is not in question, really. But this second capital L, lowercase o-r-d, is when we get to the Hebrew eventually, I'm, I'm not looking at it just yet, I'm, I'm avoiding it at the moment, is actually the word Adoni, according to the vowel markings that the Masoretic tradition has uh, preserved for us. Biblical Unitarian is letting us know that when we get later on down in the book of Psalms, in this particular Psalm, in verse 5, we have the word Lord again, but this time it's Adonai. I'll go ahead and show it to you now, even though we're not dealing with verse 5 just yet. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings in the day of his wrath. Notice it's capital L, lowercase o-r-d, right there. If we were to look that up in the Hebrew, we will find out that this is not the Tetragrammaton Y-H-V-H, Yahweh. Instead, it's the Hebrew word written out, Adonai, as compared to Adoni, which showed up earlier in verse 1, but it's written in the same English form, capital L, lowercase o-r-d. So that's what Biblical Unitarian is trying to alert us to this fact. There's two Hebrew words, but this shows up in our English Bibles as one English word often, and we can get confused if we don't go back and do our homework. Let's continue with Biblical Unitarian. Scholars recognize there is a distinction between the words 
Adoni and Adonai, and that these distinctions are important. They have this quote from the International Standard Biblical Encyclopedia from their notes. So here's what we read. Quote, the form Adoni, my Lord, a royal title from 1 Samuel, is to be carefully distinguished from the divine title Adonai, my Lord, used of Yahweh. That's their quote from that uh, biblical resource. Let's keep reading. Remember, let me interject before I keep reading. As I interact with the Biblical Unitarian Resource and their website here, what I find is a lot of what they are bringing to the table of discussion is actually factual and accurate. They're bringing truth. However, they're not bringing the total picture. They're not giving us the complete explanation. My example given last week is as if um, God was um, challenging an unbeliever to read the Bible so that they can understand the plan of salvation and understand their relationship to God, their responsibility to the God that created them. So God says to this imaginary person that I'm describing, pick up my word if you understand want to understand the meaning of life and the purpose for living, right? What's the meaning of life? What's the purpose for our creation? Well, you can read about it in the Bible. So this person picks up the Bible, a standard Christian Bible, 66 books from Genesis to Revelation. He picks up the Bible and he reads through the Old Testament. And then he stops, he puts the Bible down, and he closes it, and he says, thank you, God, for explaining the meaning of life to me. Now, what's the problem with this picture? The problem is that the person didn't finish the story. You and I know that that's only half the story. If you stop at the Old Testament, you're getting an incomplete picture and um, view of God's purpose and plans for your life. This is what unbelieving Israel does today. It's what national Israel um, and rabbinic Judaism does. They only read half the book. What they need to do if they want to understand the full picture is they need to pick up their reading, continue where they left off, starting the book of Matthew, and don't finish until you get to the book of Revelation. Right? That's what you need to do. You need to finish the story by reading the rest of the book. Well, in similar fashion, Biblical Unitarian is telling us truth. The first half of the Bible is true. The Old Testament is true. There's nothing false about it. It's The problem is, in my example, that the um, person is cutting themselves short by only exposing themselves to half the story. That's what Biblical Unitarian is kind of doing. They're giving us a lot of information that's true and factual about the details about this Hebrew word and that Hebrew word, and et cetera, et cetera. But they're not giving the full weight of Scripture the way that the New Testament has revealed it to us to unfold the mystery that the Old Testament um, laid out for us. God gave his revelation, uh, God gave the revelation of himself to the, the Bible writers only partially in the Old Testament. The fullest revelation came in the incarnation when Yeshua came onto the scene and re demonstrated that he was God among men, that he was God walking among men in the person of Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. As mysterious as that seems, yes, God showed up as a human once before when he appeared before Abraham, right? We read about that reference just a moment ago. So if God can do it for 10 minutes or 30 minutes and have lunch with Abraham, why couldn't he do it for 33 years in the person of his son, Yeshua? Well, biblical Unitarianism doesn't want, biblical Unitarian doesn't want us to consider that fact. They only want us to, to look at and focus on half of the story. So that's the weakness to their argument. But let's keep reading their argument and see what else they have to say. There are several uses of Adonai that refer to angels or men, giving them an elevated status, but not indicating that the speaker believed they were God. This is in keeping with the language as a whole. Studies of words like Elohim, which we did in previous studies, show that it's also occasionally used of humans who have elevated status. So they're just trying to show us that, hey, this word Adonai has some general purpose use, Adonai, Adonai. Um, we need to carefully distinguish when the context is referring to deity and when it's just referring to a human with elevated status. And so that's where they're going. They continue. Examples of Adonai referring to humans include Genesis 19, 24, and 39. Those particular chapters, go back and read them on your own. In contrast to Adonai being used occasionally of men, there's no time when Adoni is used of God. Men may be elevated, but God is never lowered. Now, I'm going to interject and just tell you right now that from a certain point of view, what they say is accurate. 
The word Adoni is never used of God. Adonai can be used of men, but the word Adoni is never used of God. Within a context, this is true. Remember my humorous clip from Star Wars where Luke and Obi-Wan are having this dialogue about the identity of Darth Vader and who killed Luke's father. And uh, Obi-Wan has to kind of backpedal in Return of the Jedi where he says, well, you know, what I told you is true, but only from a certain point of view. Okay, the same thing is kind of going on here. What they're saying here, it is true, but only from a certain point of view. What we're going to find out later on is that actually the word Adoni is used to refer to God in many, many places in the Bible, especially in the books of uh, the, the historical accounts of like the book of 1 Kings, 2 Kings, etc., um, where it's referring to God, but its application is um, in the names of humans who have named themselves with titles for God. So the title is God's title, but the um, application is to a human. So that's what I mean by the special context of, yeah, they're telling you the truth, but only from a certain perspective. They want you to believe that nowhere in the Bible is Adoni referring to God or indicating God or implicating God or associated with God. And I'm just telling, I'm telling you that's simply not factual. So given that truth that I haven't turned to yet, you just have to trust me now because I'm going to get to it in time. Let me look at my time. Yeah, I'm doing good. Um, given that truth, what can we make of biblical Unitarian's explanation here? Are they lying to us? Are they purposely trying to deceive us? I don't think they are. Honestly, I'm going to give them that benefit. I don't think they're trying to deceive people. I simply think that they're not very um, accurate in their research. Here. They they haven't done all their homework. They are just, they're blindsided. And this, is, this of course, is always going to be the position of those who oppose God's revelation in some way, shape, or form. They're going to leave themselves open to deception and blindness towards certain truths, just like rabbinic Judaism. When they talk about uh, who God is and, and their relationship to God and His commandments, and et cetera, et cetera, there's a lot of truth to what they say, but they have this, this glaring blindness because of their rejection of who Jesus is, right? The Messiah. And so you can trust part of what they say, but only to an extent, because at some point their insight is going to drop off because they are blinded to the rest of the revelation of what the Bible teaches. Same thing is kind of going on with Biblical Unitarian. They are blind, but they probably just don't know it. They don't realize that they're um, leaving um, a very important part out of the um, explanation of, of uh, who God is and what he's trying to reveal. Let's keep reading their explanation, though. The following reference can be found under um, M underscore Adoni, uh, Genesis 48, uh, 18. I'm not exactly sure what they're trying to say there. Uh, M underscore Adoni, um, M Adoni, um, I believe what they're trying to, they're trying to, uh, if I go back and look up the passage, I believe what they're trying to do is they're trying to um, uh, uh, describe when we have the word Adoni and it's, um, it's uh, it's pre pre uh, it has a prefixed uh, either sometimes a, a a type of a um, um, some type of a grammar uh, feature that lets us know that it's like a preposition of sorts like l, l adonai ladonai or m adonai you know madoni or madonai or ladoni or b adonai badoni or something like that. So I'm I'm trying to avoid getting too technical. Let's keep reading. Uh, what they have to say about this particular verse. Remember, we're having this discussion about Psalm 110, verse 1, which uh, reads in the NASB, a Psalm of David, the Lord says to my Lord, sit in my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. According to the Trinitarian model, the lowercase, the, the capital L, lowercase O-R-D, the second Lord in your uh, on your screen there, that's Yeshua. Both of us agree. Biblical Unitarian, they agree this is Yeshua. Trinitarians, we agree this is Yeshua. The point of contention is that Biblical Unitarian maintains that this Lord sitting at the right hand of God is a human. But we Trinitarians realize that in the Incarnation, Jesus is truly human. Yes, he is human sitting at the right hand of God, but he's fully divine. He didn't lose his divinity. He didn't, um, he didn't uh, give that up when he took on human flesh. He simply veiled his divinity. It was... Um, it was uh, hidden from humanity in that in that moment when he became uh, um, when he took on humanity when he became a man the mystery of the incarnation 
So we're having this discussion about this particular psalm. Is this Messiah sitting at the right hand of God, is he fully human or is he divine? Let me interject with just one question real quick. Sometimes I want to ask the biblical Unitarian uh, adherents to their particular denomination. If you believe that Jesus is fully human, truly human, then what do you make of the fact that now he can sit at the right hand of God and lives forevermore, right? He's not, he's more than human now. At the very least, he's some kind of meta-human, right? Because he, he's he been given the special status of sitting at the right hand of God, and he can now perform actions that no mere human can do. For instance, he can simultaneously hear the prayers of all the saints that are directed towards him, right? We clearly have biblical examples where Jesus um, tells uh, believers to pray to him and to, um, you know, to worship him and to direct their prayers to him. You know, he clearly informs his disciples that after he leaves that he's going to be with them by the Spirit. And so I guess biblical Unitarians answer to how can Jesus do superhuman things even though he's truly human, their answer is going to say, well, he does it by the power of the Spirit. The Spirit of Jesus, who's been sent to dwell among us and with us, which is just the Spirit of God according to their understanding, he allows these, this simultaneous interaction between Jesus and everyone else in the world simultaneously. But there are still other details and features about Jesus that when you read through the rest of Scripture, he does things in and um, he's described in ways that are obviously, um, that seem to have divine attributes. Um, I'm trying not to spoil all of my explanation just yet, but those are some of the questions I'd really love to dialogue a, a biblical Unitarian one day and ask him, what do you make of some of the extra human things that Jesus can and does do in other parts of Scripture after he's already died and resurrected. Um, if you say it's because he's he's now simply anointed by God, and that's and we're all anointed by God, I mean, well, we're not sitting at God's right hand, right? Okay, so this is the verse that's in question. Let's keep reading um, this explanation from their uh, website. They go on to say, Students of Hebrew know that the original text was written in an unpointed form, i.e., without the dots, dashes, and marks that are now the written vowels. So let me just um, show you what I'm talking about. This time, let me scroll over and show you some of the Hebrew. So if you're looking at this uh, text on your screen right now, this is Psalm 110.1. And what you see on the majority of your screen are consonants, all those letters that read from left to right or right to left, depending on how you're looking at them. They're all consonants. However, there, there are these little dots and dashes and symbols that appear below, mostly below the letters. Some are above, but most of them are below. Some of them are in between. Some of them look like colon marks. Some like look like miniature letter T's. Some just look like little periods. There's a few that look like little chevrons or commas or um, a diamond shape. Some look like three dots that are di diagonal running, etc., etc. Some look like a little minus sign. Um, all of these little um, dots and dashes were added by the um, the Masoretic tradition uh, to to fill in for what they know to be the vowel sounds. Otherwise, let me see if I can show you what it looks like um, without the vowel markings. Give me a moment. I didn't have this. Um, I wasn't uh, intending on doing this right away, but let me just show it to you first. So on this particular screen. This first uh, example here is the same verse with all the little dots and dashes that most people are used to reading, like I just showed you a moment ago. But notice right directly below it, it says it's the same verse, but without all the little dots and dashes. Can you see that there? Can you guys understand the differences? Let me blow that up a little bit um, for you so you can see it a little better. So um, here we have all the dots and dashes, but here we have the dots and dashes missing. It's just the consonants only. So that's what's going on. Let me drop that back down to where it used to be. So this is what um, Biblical Unitarian is going to start reminding us about. Okay? Sorry about that. So these little dots and dashes, what about them? Let's continue. Thus, some scholars may point out that since the vowel points of the Hebrew text were added later, the rabbis could have been mistaken. And this is true. Right? What if the Masoretic tradition was wrong? Right? I mean, it is just a tradition. We'll talk about that a little later, but let's keep reading what Biblical Unitarian says. It should be pointed out, they say, however, that the two Hebrew words Adonai and Adoni, even though written the same in unpointed text, 
sound different when pronounced. Are you guys following what I'm saying here? Let me bring up another graphic just to show you what I'm talking about. Blow that up a little bit. So on the right side of the screen, we have Adonai, pronounced as Adon plus I, and it's a a uh, title reserved exclusively for God. And with little dots and dashes underneath, we get that pronunciation Adonai, or transliterated as A-D-O-N-A-I. However, comparatively, on the left side of your screen, we have the same word if we were to remove all the little dots and dashes, but because of the, the Masoretic tradition that has been preserved by the family of transcribers in the verbal form, Adonai is not pronounced the same way. It suddenly becomes Adoni. Sounds like a different vowel at the very end. It looks the same without the vowels, but when we put in those little dots and dashes, we end up with a, a transliterated A-D-O-N-A-I, pronounced as Adon plus E. So Adoni nearly always refers to human superiors. As I mentioned on, this, uh, on the screen here, both of these are translated as capital L, lowercase o-r-d, or sometimes lowercase l-o-r-d, depending on your Bible translation. But um, we can't have both have been tra translated as capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's a different Hebrew word altogether. But just to alert you to what biblical Unitarian is referring to, if you take away the little dots and dashes, the little minus signs, the little colon signs, the little, um, little like the little letter T that's highlighted there in red that says kamatz, versus the little period-looking thing over on the right, left side that says chirik. If you take those away from the, the text, then the, the, the words just look identical in the Hebrew. So that's what um, we're dealing with. So how do we know which word is which? Well, we have a tradition of different sounding pronunciation, even when the words look the same um, in the text. So they say, this is not unusual in a language. Read and read are spelled the same, right? R-E-A-D, R-E-A-D. They're spelled the same, but one can be pronounced R-E-D, read, as in I read the book yesterday, while the other is to pronounce read, R-E-E-D, as in please read the book to me. So notice their um, example here is that if we're dealing with just what we're seeing, we would be misled if we had no no tradition of pronunci pronunciation to follow behind it. So if English is not your um, native language and you can't read English, and then suddenly someone teaches you just this single word, R-E-A-D, without the additional vocal pronunciation and the context, you wouldn't know how to pronounce this word R-E-A-D. Is it spoken as read or is it spoken as read, right? Only context can tell as in the two examples. So this is a good example, and I agree. Like I said, they're not telling 100% lies here. They're not just um, bald-faced bald -faced lying to us so far. They're giving details that are accurate and that are good within a context. Let's continue their explanation. The correct way to place the vowels in the text would have been preserved, speaking of the Hebrew, in the oral tradition of the Jews. Thus, when the text was finally written with the vowels, it would have been written as it was always pronounced. So that's why the vowel markings, let me go back to that picture, the vowel markings on the left side are different from the vowel markings on the right side. The vowel markings under Adoni on the left are different for the vowel markings under Adonai on the right. That's because even though they look the same without the little dots, like the original script read, like I just showed you earlier, even though they really look the same without the dots, because there's a also a running vocal tradition that accompanied the written tradition, then that vocal tradition would have told us how to um, pronounce them, even though we're looking at the same word uh, with our eyes. And again, it's only the later tradition of the dots and dashes that came along later that um, made it uh, even more um, uh, substantial, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? more um, um, certain as to what word we're reading. Let's keep reading. But this can, this can come back around and bite us, as we're going to find later on. But let's keep reading their, uh, their explanation so far. We've got about, about six or five or six minutes left in this uh, particular study. I want to make it through at least another paragraph or two. Further evidence, this is Biblical Unitarian, further evidence that the Jews always thought that the word in Psalm 110.1 referred to a human Messiah and not God come to earth is given 
in the Greek text. So now what they're going to do is they're going to transition from showing us how that the proof not only is in the Hebrew, like we just talked about Adonai Adoni, but the proof is also in the Greek, which I've just so happened to have the Greek pulled up uh, for us. Um, am I on the right verse here? Wow. Oh, that's not the verse I was looking for. Sorry, it's over here. I've got the uh, the, the Greek pulled up for us as well. Um, and so we're going to begin to look at this eventually. Let me go ahead and highlight that for you. You can see it. There's the Greek. Well, let's um, let's de- see what uh, Biblical Unitarian has to say about the Greek. So it's been preserved to us in the Greek text, both in the Septuagint and in quotations in the New Testament. You have to remind yourself that the Greek translation of the Hebrew, which was put together 200 years before the uh, Common Era, at least 200, perhaps even 300 years before the Common Era, the Greek, the Septuagint was already being uh, translated or being used by Greek-speaking Jews. And then later on, with the tradition of the New Testament being written in Greek, we now have quotations from the Hebrew Bible that are translated into the New Testament Greek, so which mimic what the Septuagint was already saying. And what this does for us is, when it comes to Psalm 110.1, remember we talked about this earlier, this particular psalm is the most oft-quoted psalm in the apostolic scriptures, in the New Testament, bar none. This shows up more often than any other psalm as quoted over in the New Testament, which means we've got many, many quotes in the Greek New Testament, which are authoritative, as well as the Septuagint Greek, which, even though it's not authoritative, it nevertheless was in use by the first century disciples as well as Jesus himself. So it becomes a very, very important witness, even if we don't consider it as authoritative in in the same regards as the New Testament. Let's continue with Biblical Unitarian's explanation. Having said all that, it is important to remember, they say, that the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, uh, was made about 250 BC, long before the Trinitarian debates started, which again is true. Yet, the Septuagint translation is clearly supportive, this is their explanation, remember, it's clearly supportive of Psalm 110.1 referring to a human Lord, lowercase l-o-r-d, not God. And so they say it translates Adoni as ha kurios mu. And if we were to bring up that translation of the uh, Septuagint. I don't want to read it just yet. I don't want to get to this just now. But what they're talking about when they saw, they say, um, uh, let me see, what did they, how do they say it? Um, Adonai's Hakurias Mu. They're talking about, um, they, they're slightly miss, I think they're they're combining uh, uh, two clauses uh, that I have highlighted on your screen right now. It doesn't really say Hakurias Mu. It actually says Hakurias Tokurio Mu. So they, they skipped a few words, but I, I understand what they're trying to say. Even if I look at um, the uh, the differing, there's two different majority versions of the of the Septuagint that are being represented by this tool that I'm using. One is the Alexandrinus version, the one on the left I just showed you a moment ago, and this version right now is the Vaticanus version that's in front of you. And this, the same clause says Hakurios Tokurio Mu. So um, I don't want to get into the Greek technicality just yet. Just learning to the fact. We'll, we'll get in that in time. Let's keep reading. We got like just a few more minutes. Let's keep reading um, some of what of, of uh, Biblical Unitarian is trying to explain to us. They go on to say that the translators of the LXX the Septuagint in the 3rd century BC attest to a careful distinction between the forms of Adon used for divine and human reference by translating Adoni as Hokurias Mu, my Lord. Again, they're they're quoting someone here um, in their little footnoting. I'll look at that later on, but I think they're just they're leaving a few details out. This time, I think it's just a a, um, a, a mistake. They're not trying to they're not trying to do this on purpose. Uh, but they keep saying when Psalm one ten one is quoted in the New Testament, the same truth about the human lordship of the Messiah is preserved. And then we have this quote again from another um, source. Many of their sources are Unitarians. Sometimes they'll quote Trinitarians in support of their uh, answer. But in closing, as we're drawing the study to a close, and I read this last paragraph, most of their quotations we're going to find are from uh, prominent Unitarians, such as Anthony Buzzard or um, uh, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Bart Ehrman or someone like that. Um, here's another quote, and we'll leave off with this quote from Biblical Unitarian. They have to say, quote, The New Testament 
when it quotes Psalm 110.1, renders Ladoni as to my Lord, Tokurio Mu. But it renders Adonai, Psalm 110, uh, 110 verse 5, and very often elsewhere as the Lord, Kurios. We'll, we'll, we'll fact check that in time. In other words, they say it translates, um, it translates, I think there's a typo there, it translates Adoni as my Lord and Adonai as the Lord. This proves, they say, that the difference between Adonai and Adoni was recognized and reported in Greek long, long before the Masoretic vowel pointings fixed the ancient oral tradition permanently in writing. So as I close, what they're just reminding us, and again, they're speaking in, in partial truths. It's, I'm, I'm avoiding saying that they're speaking in half-truths because I don't think they're purposely trying to lie and deceive. I just think they are unknowingly deceived themselves by um, cutting themselves off from the authority of the New Testament in its totality and the mystery that's been revealed by the New Testament writings. They open themselves up to error. And so they're telling us about this difference in the Greek between Adonai and Adoni. And part of it is true in the sense that by the time the transla translation from the Hebrew into Greek was already being utilized, the Greek was going to represent something that the tradition of the Jewish people had already been utilizing with, this, with these terms uh, Adoni and Adonai. So we'll get to some more of those technicalities in time. We'll pick this study up again next week, right where I left off in the screen. What did we learn tonight in closing, um, in kind of summary fashion? We learned that there are two Hebrew words that can be translated as Lord in your English Bible. And when we say Lord, we're talking about that that starts out with a capital L, but then follows with a lowercase O-R-D. O -R -D. Remember, in your Bible, there's a few different ways to, to um, display the word Lord. Um, there's about three different ways. Maybe I'll do a little screen grab in post-production. There's the capital L-O-R-D with all caps like you see on my screen now. There's this one in the middle here where you see a capital L and then the rest are lowercase O-R-D. And then there's one where the, the um, L is capitalized and the O-R-D are capital letters, but they're, they're shrunken in size, right? It's kind of an odd, uh, a, a not very often used. But for, for our um, explanation and our summary, what we're learning is that Biblical Unitarian wants us to understand that these two words represent two different, well, not these two here, but the, the verse 1 and then the verse 5 down here where it says, the Lord is at your right hand. They want us to, to um, uh, recognize that these two um, words uh, in Hebrew are represented by two differing Hebrew words, Adoni and Adonai, and these two words have also been carried over into the Greek as um, tokuria or tokurio or kurios, etc., etc. They want us to be aware of the differing Hebrew and Greek words, but they also want us to be aware of the um, tradition that has been preserved by the scribal families that were responsible for preserving and transmitting the text that we have available for us and the ones that we consider authoritative. So that's where there's going to be some very important interaction that we need to be aware of as we go forward in our um, understanding of these uh, passages and this particular passage in Psalm 110 verse 1. That'll conclude for tonight for our study on Psalm 110 verse 1 and a Trinitarian response to biblical Unitarianism. We'll pick this up next week with this particular uh, passage, uh, but stay safe and be blessed and join us next week, okay? Let's close in prayer for those of you with me in my live class uh, and those of you who have stayed for, for the entire live uh, study. Um, let's close in prayer and dismiss in prayer. And then for those who are in the live class, if you'd like to have some more open discussion on any given topic, we can do so. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and dismiss and uh, call it a night and uh, join again next week. Abba, I bless your name. Abba, I'm thankful for the study. I'm thankful for the materials. I'm very thankful for your word and for for the fact that the Holy Spirit preserved it for us down to this very day, despite the attempts of evil men and the adversary to um, uh, destroy the Word of God and cause it to disappear uh, from history and to be confused with all the other not uh, mumbo-jumbo historical writings that are out there. To just consider that the Bible is just one of many history books that has lots of errors. But we don't hold that to be true of your Word. We know in its original autographs that it is um, trustworthy, it's reliable, and uh, all the words are um, your words. Thank you even for the translations that we have, which 
uh, though they contain some um, maybe some errors here and there, some uh, some guesses, some questions here and there. Nevertheless, for the most part, the central message of your word has been preserved, even in the translations. Uh, thank you for this um, duty and responsibility to carry your word around the world and present the gospel truth to any man who will listen. Thank you for opening the hearts and minds of those who are interacting with us via these YouTube videos, via the iTunes podcast, uh, the people that I interact with via um, email and uh, YouTube comments and things like that. Bless you, Lord. Uh, uh, may your name be magnified. May your kingdom be enlarged. And may Yeshua receive all the glory for lives that are changed as a result of the resources that people interact with that happen to be my own, my website, my YouTube channel, my iTunes podcasts, my blogs, my um, uh, 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 commentaries that I write, my PDFs that I upload to different um, platforms and things like that. Lord, uh, all of this belongs to you. So you receive the glory for uh, and the credit for all that, uh, for the, the um, changes that take place in the positive. Um, thank you for all the students who join me week after week. Bless them, protect them, raise them up, and continue to provide for them and continue to keep us safe as we go along, uh, marching along uh, uh, towards the uh, final uh, end times uh, that we know are going to be extremely challenging and terrifying, but we trust you. We have no fear as we long as we keep our trust in you and keep our eyes focused on Messiah. We'll be careful, Lord, to give you the praise and the glory of Yeshua. Amen. Oh,